Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, your friendly guide to the English language. We talk about writing, history, rules, and other cool stuff. I am still getting people asking me questions about how to make names that end with S possessive, even though I did a show about it three weeks ago, included it in my newsletter, and posted about it on social media. So if you missed that, check out episode 1006. But I'm also hearing people lament that some mysterious they people have made apostrophes too complicated, which reminded me of a short interview I did way back in 2014 with Ammon Shea that had the title, Apostrophes Were Always Confusing. I was going to just post it on social, but when I listened to it, I enjoyed it so much that I wanted you to hear it too. So that'll be first, and then after that, I'll have a segment about whether you should use first or firstly. Next, I have an interview with Amon Shea, the author of one of my favorite new books, Bad English. Hi, Amon. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Really, I just adored your book. And in particular, I want to talk about the chapter about apostrophes. Uh, the source of never-ending trouble. <laughs> right. People complain about them today, but your book says that people have been complaining about them for a really long time. Right. It's something that, uh, it's a real constant. We, we, we have this idea that at some point in the past, it was a kind of utopian period of apostrophic normalcy or something <laughs> or what have you. And it, it's never been the case. Ever since their introduction into the language, uh, apostrophes have kind of shifted and changed, and they've never been subject to any sort of agreement. And the the French hoisted these upon us, is that right? Well, it's either the French or the Italians. Since we're so fond of blaming other bad habits on the French, I think that many people go with that. Um, <laughs> there's uh, M.B. Parks, who wrote a wonderful book, a comprehensive book on punctuation in the Western world called Pause and Effect. He thought it came up first in a 1509 edition of uh, an Italian book of Petrarch. Many people think, however, that Geoffrey Torrey, who was a, a French printer who also is responsible for introducing us to the sedilla and the accent, he used it in 1529 in French. So that's, it was definitely in use by that point. <laughs> so in the beginning, it was it was clear how to use the apostrophe? Well, not quite. <laughs> it's never actually been clear. It first comes into English in the, uh, about 30 years later in 1559. And at first, it was really just used as a contraction or a mark of religion. We used it when we left out a letter or several letters. and but So that was fairly clear. There was no definite, rigid opinion on what letters could be left out or what couldn't be left out. But if you wanted to drop a letter in the middle of a sentence, uh, in the middle of a word, you would use an apostrophe. Of course, we're also talking about a time period when some very small percentage of the population was actually literate. So for most people, the apostrophe had no great impact on their lives. <laughs> okay. And then you said, uh, by the restoration People were getting completely carried away with this well, contraction yeah. idea. You know, it's you know, the, when, once you start using it, I guess it's it's kind of like crack. The apostrophe, it's kind of <laughs> addictive, you know. So there were people doing a uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary of English Usage has some wonderful examples of a uh, uh, I apostrophe F A C was found, which I, I am pretty sure means in fact. Um, my personal favorite was apostrophe Z B U D which is an abbreviated form of God's blood. Um, so you get a lot of words kind of like that. Of course, this is also um, at a point where spelling is not that consistent. So um, you mix an indefinite spelling system and the free use of apostrophes and things can get a little bit tricky. Yeah, I appreciated the interpretation you had of some of the words in your book, because I, I never would have been able to guess. Yeah, it's not immediately obvious when you see apostrophe Z-B-U-D that this is a, a, a shortening of a euphemistic kind of uh, religious term. Right. And I was surprised to read that some people initially considered the possessive apostrophe to be an error. Yeah, well, it, it kind of came late to the party. I mean, um, one thing that's been noted is that in Shakespeare's first folio in 1623, only about 4% of the words that today we would give an apostrophe to in the possessive case, um, like Othello. Uh, Romeo's heart, only about 4% of those actually have an apostrophe. It was not very common at the uh, beginning of the 17th century, and it really took a while for it to catch on. And there was confusion and some degree of consternation because people didn't really know 
what the apostrophe was doing there in the possessive or the genitive case. And um, this is before we figured out all the rules of English, which, of course, we haven't f- figured it out yet. But um, there, there, was, there was a great deal of um, – a great number of misconceptions about the English language back then. And so some people thought that it was a mark of religion. So the king's book, the apostrophe, was a shortening of the king his book. And that was a kind of widespread theory for a while. And then some other people came along and more or less said, that's a very stupid idea. That's not the case. But people really disagreed about it vehemently. And then some people then think that what the apostrophe is doing is it's kind of hearkening back to our old English roots. So it was common in the masculine and the neuter genitive cases. So the King's Book, for instance, Mm -hmm. uh, to add an ES at the end of the noun that would indicate possession. So if you look at it that way, well, sure, it makes sense. We're actually taking out the E and putting in an apostrophe, and that's why we have K-I-N-G apostrophe S. It's a pretty good theory. Um, I think a lot of people who pay attention to this, at least six or seven of them, subscribe to that theory. <laughs> but there was no real agreement on that this, well, that this was okay. And then when people started getting comfortable with it, some people would say, well, sure, we can do it for singular nouns. We can't do it for plural nouns. That's madness. <laughs> I, I, I really don't understand why they got so worked up about it, but it was a big deal. And was this in the 18th century? Uh, yes. Yeah, so grammarians were fighting about lots of things then, right? They were fighting about the color of their socks back then. I mean, anything they could get a fight out of, they would grab and, and, you know, and none of them agreed with each other. Um, People were writing entire books just attacking their predecessor's position on what to do with the genitive apostrophe and singular noun. I mean, they'd fight over anything they could. (laughs) It was was like the TMZ of grammar. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) And you say that, you know, even today, the apostrophe is in flux. You point to how writing decades has changed. Right. So, you know, several decades ago, no pun intended, if you wrote, um, say, the 1950s, you would write 1950 apostrophe S. And that is generally not the case now. So that's, you know, that's just the blink of an eye. I mean, something changing in 30 years, that's nothing in terms of uh, the history of the language that we're looking at. Um, For instance, a lot of department stores have started dropping their apostrophe. The uh, famous British store, whose name I always mispronounce, it's either Harrods or Harrods, whatever, Harrods, I believe. Um, Mm -hmm. They stopped using an apostrophe a little while ago. Um, Macy's over here still holds on to their apostrophes. They're very fond of them. But um, I just noticed today that Marshall's department store does not use an apostrophe. And um, I'm pretty sure that they used to. Uh, Hmm. It was started by a man whose last name was Marshall. So Marshall's is probably means that it's his store. And uh, I've seen a number of old um, newspaper articles referring to Marshall's department store where it did in fact have an apostrophe. This is in like 1971. And I think that some of these stores just kind of realized, well, we don't really need it. I mean, it's it's not doing us any substantial good and it's taking up real estate. So let's stop using it. I think it would not be surprising if this were to happen more and more frequently, given that we do not use apostrophes in um, typing out URLs. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's kind of, you know, once you see that you don't need it, then it's very easy to do away with it in other contexts, I think. Right. And it's a character if you're trying to hit 140 characters on Twitter. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So to end, you say that we're even flummoxed by how to pronounce the word apostrophe, and we're all getting it wrong. So set me right. straight. Well, yeah, that, that's my, 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 my thing that I say. If, if anybody does correct you on how you use your apostrophes, you can always turn around and correct them on the way that they pronounce it. <laughs> the current edition of the Oxford English Dictionary no longer says this, but um, the, the first edition of the OED, they had a kind of peevish and querulous editorial note, one of the very few that they have in that dictionary under apostrophe where the editor, James Murray, said that it should be pronounced as the French pronounce it, which is apostrophe, (laughs) Um, and three syllables rather than four, with the emphasis on the final syllable. Apostrophe. Apostrophe. And you would know, because you also wrote a book about the OED, right? (laughs) Right, which is where I would have seen it. (laughs) Right, and what was that called again? Uh, It was called, it had a very unimaginative title, which was Reading the OED. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And now your new book is Bad English. Again, that was Amon Shea, the author of Bad English. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.
Hi, Mignon. This is Rick, and I'm an academic surgeon and a logophile. And I have two questions for you, which have been rather elusive for me as I do a lot of speaking and writing. The first is related to enumeration of points. So although it's in common usage, we typically hear first there's this and second there's that. But I've heard and some cases I've read, it should be firstly there's this and secondly there's that. So that's my first question. So I'm going to jump in here and answer this first question. The short answer is that most usage guides today recommend first, second, and third, simply because they're shorter and sound less fussy than firstly, secondly, and thirdly. But I found some interesting things as I was checking my books to make sure I was remembering correctly. First, people have been writing about how much they dislike firstly since the mid-1800s, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary of English Usage. At first, because they thought it was new. For example, Thomas de Quincey said it was, quote, a ridiculous and most pedantic neologism, unquote. But he was wrong about that. People had been using firstly for 300 years. But no matter. Eventually, in more modern times, usage guides have settled on the it's better because it's shorter rationale. Second, firstly is used more often in British English than in American English. At peak firstly usage in 1940, a Google Ngram search shows that firstly was used 1,200% more often in British English than American English. But it's fallen a lot since then, and in 2021, British use was only 160% higher than American use. So still more, but not so dramatically more. Now, firstly, secondly, and so on aren't wrong, so if you want to use them, you can. But my advice is to be consistent and not mix them. I'd say don't use first and then secondly. But surprisingly, that doesn't seem to be universal advice or something that famous writers always pay attention to. For example, Merriam-Webster has a section going through the ways that well-known writers have just used different forms together willy-nilly. For example, William Hazlitt, a prominent essayist and critic from the 1700s, used the series first of all, secondly, and then in the third place. And lest you think, oh, that's just the old timers, Garner's Modern English Usage, which does recommend first, second, and third, also says, quote, many stylists prefer first over firstly, even when the remaining signposts are secondly and thirdly, unquote. And wow, I would never prefer that, but apparently others do. And he also adds that using just one, two, and three can be done, but that it sounds especially informal. And to finish, I'll tell you a funny thing about my own writing that popped up when I was working on my last LinkedIn learning course. I apparently often start a section with first and then never get to a second and third. Now, that's not terrible. You can use first as a general introductory word. But Pat was listening to me record and asked a couple of times why I didn't have the rest of the numbers for my follow-up points. So if you tend to do this too, and you want to avoid a few people wondering where your second and third are, you can lead in with something else, like to begin with, which has less of a sense that you're starting a numbered list. So thanks for the question, Rick. That's probably more than you ever thought there was to say about the topic. But the quick and dirty tip is to stick with first, second, and so on. Also, Rick's second question was a bigger one about quotation marks. And Rick, if you're listening, first, thanks for the question. And second, I'm just going to direct you to episode 740 from 2019, which is a complete overview about double and single quotation marks. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Finally, I have a Familect story. Hi, Grammar Girl. Mark from England here. As soon as you mentioned the WhatsApp chat link, I thought I'd send in my Familect. This one started many years ago in our family. There used to be a sponsored advert before a soap opera by a popular chocolate brand. In the ad, they're making a TV show, and while they're filming, one of the production staff, called Trudy, wanders onto the set, daydreaming while eating the chocolate bar. The director exclaims, there's someone on the set. Trudy. Ever since then, if any of our family are trying to take a photo or video and one of us gets in the way of the camera, we'll shout, Trudy, 
as a shorthand to get out of the way. Love the show and well done on over a thousand episodes. Thanks so much, Mark, and thanks for sharing your story. If you have a family act story to share, I would love to hear it. And now you can record a voice memo for me in the chat on WhatsApp, which generally makes the audio sound better than the old voicemail line. The link is in the show notes, and be sure to use the voice chat feature, not the phone feature. Grammar Girl is a quick and dirty tips podcast. Thanks to Holly Hutchings in digital operations, Davina Tomlin in marketing, Morgan Christensen in advertising, Brandon Getchus, director of podcasts, and Dan Firealband in audio, who gamer sizes daily with his VR headset. And I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. That's all. Thanks for listening.